uh, caller, thank you for being patient. Tell us your name and please. Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Mario. Oh, very good. Welcome to the show. What is the question for Rabbi? Thank you. Uh, I'm so excited to talk to you guys. I'm really, really happy. Awesome. And that's a great honor for me to talk to you guys. Thank you. Uh, I uh, my question might be a question. I'm not sure. Uh, Rabbi Tuvia, uh, several times. Shalom Rav, Rabbi Tuvia. Many times you mentioned that in your book, in your book, uh, Matthew, uh, he said he had 11 citations that he misquote the Tanakh. And yeah. I know like four or five of them, but I you know in any way I can know all the 11 citations. Are you asking me where in the book of Matthew will I find, will I encounter Matthew's fulfillment citations? Is that your question? Yeah, uh, maybe they are called fulfillment citation. Uh, Eleven sure. quotes. Eleven quotes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh. So you just want to know? You just want to know where you would find that? You'll find it in, in Matthew one twenty three, uh, where uh, Jesus is to be born of a virgin, as it quote, misquoting Isaiah. You will find it in um, in Matthew two. We are told that the Messiah is to be born in Bethlehem. And also, we have another one that's in 2 verse 6. You have another one in 2 verse 15, where very famously, uh, Jesus is, uh, excuse me, Joseph, Mary's husband, is told by the angel to flee Israel and to go to Egypt and be thou there until I bring thee word for Herod is seeking the young child to destroy him and he came and took the child of this verse 14 and fled by night to Egypt to be filled which is spoken through the prophet saying out of Egypt have I called my son that's of course a bogus quote because Matthew's only quoting the last half of chapter 11 verse 1 and then you can go to chapter 2 17 which is a misquote of Jeremiah but then it gets really wacky and then you have the very very big misquote is Matthew 2 23 where we are told by the first gospel to fill which was spoken by the Lord that he shall be called a Nazarene a citizen of the city of Nazareth so that, of course, is, is nonsensical because there is actually no such prophecy. In fact, the city of Nazareth exists nowhere. Christians sometimes say that, well, Jesus, if you notice the pictures, he had long hair. Maybe he was a Nazarite. Well, that won't work uh, because a Nazir is a different word. It's a Nun Zion, uh, Nazir, and in Hebrew, the city is called Natseret, so it's Nunsad, these two different words. Then you have one that's wild, really, really wild. Um, and that is, I'm, by the way, I'm just moving through this quickly. They have one I never taught yet, but I'm going to teach in the upcoming uh, show on part seven of Isaiah, where if you'll notice that in a Jewish Bible, Isaiah chapter 8 ends with verse 23. But you'll notice in the Christian Bible, Isaiah chapter 8 ends with verse 22. And 23, what happens at 23? You didn't throw it in the garbage can. It's then shoved into the beginning of verse 9. So Isaiah chapter 8 verse 23 is shoved away is ripped out of the context and wow is it ripped out of context it, the, i will explain it in the show on isaiah because you have to know the whole background and then I, in a christian bible you have two different texts isaiah 9 1 and 2 are two opposite things isaiah 9 1 in a christian bible not a jewish bible is discussing the destruction of the northern kingdom in the destruction of the kingdom of Israel, by Sancherev, who came first and took away the tribe of Asher and Zebulun, which were in the north. And then he went on the other side of the sea, and he, took, he carried off the, 
the, uh, the God Ruvain and half the tribe of Manasseh. And then the worst, worst, worst thing is he finally came for a third and then he carried the rest. And that third one is the worst, okay? And then if you go to, and then he carried the rest. And that third one is the worst, okay? So that's what that is. And then if you go to the very next passage, the next chapter opens up with a whole new concept. The people who, now it's referring to the southern kingdom. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. That's not referring to them. This is the southern kingdom which was fulfilled. And if you compare it, I don't want to give away the show we're going to do. Really, I, I mean, look, if, you, if you're if a sincere Christian, I think, of why would you watch the show if you're not? If you read Matthew chapter uh, 4, verse 14, 15, 16, just do that. And look in your footnotes. You know, I'm not setting up a, a straw man. And then go back to what it says in Isaiah... 9, 1, and 2 in a Christian Bible. And you see how Matthew stripped the text and literally pulled off words everywhere to, dis- to convey and convince the reader that, because what, what is Matthew 4, 14, 15, 16? This is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. This is right before the Sermon of the Mount, and this is right after the temptation. This is the opening. This is like, da 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 That means we have our infancy, we have a temptation. It's all done now, Jesus raised his eyes. And it begins with a bomb. And if it's, I tell you, because it's, a little, it's not really complicated, most people don't study these texts. If you, but if you compare, just do it. And please, use a Christian Bible. So don't think like Jews conspired. Take two Christian Bibles and take Matthew um, 4, 14, which says, this is the fill what it says in Isaiah, and then you look at the footnote, it'll say Isaiah 9, 1 and 2, just do it. If you do this honestly as a Christian, if you're not, by the way, if you're too dug into Christianity, which I get, people are too into their thing or the social consequence of grace, this is not for you. But if you're sincere, like I want to know, is this Christian Bible trustworthy or not? Because... Everything's at stake. If Matthew lied, what happened to Matthew is what happened to Bernie Madoff. He should have been thrown in prison. And you sit there and just do this with the Christian Bible. Have two of them. Have Matthew 4, 15, and 16. And Matthew tells the verse 4 that I'm quoting Isaiah, so you know that. Look at the footnote. It'll, it'll cross-reference Isaiah 9, 1. And then see how much of of Isaiah 9-1 was jettisoned to produce something that has nothing to do with what the original intention was. If you really study it tonight, you'll, this Sabbath you'll be in a synagogue and you will, ne- you, will, you, will, you will mail in or call your pastor and resign from the church. You have to, if you're honest. Or at the very least, go, this is a very serious problem. And if you say that Matthew had some sort of... Matthew had some sort of license to do this, midrashic license like the rabbis do, or the Holy Spirit was speaking to him, so he was allowed to do these things. So then what religion could be dismissed? Then how do you then reject Mormonism? How do you then reject Roman Catholicism? They're all saying that. Every religion is saying that we have a special revelation, and it's based on that special revelation that we are devoted to our religion. Protestantism should be saying sola scriptura, saying no, it's, it's got to be, well, why is Matthew giving, when I say free prayers, this is, this is not a nuance, my friends, it isn't. It just read Isaiah 9.1, do it, and just say to God, wherever this takes me, I'll go. I never taught this. No one can ever say that I taught this. I never taught, I only taught this to my classes, my students who I taught Isaiah to. Because the context is, it's not so complicated, but people don't know Isaiah very well. But if you just compare, just take the text and say, okay, what did Matthew have to delete to come up with this skeleton of a text? Which has nothing to do with what it originally says. I think reasonably you have to say, I have to reevaluate my my commitment to Christianity. And if you don't, 
that means you're saying special revelation. And if you're saying special revelation, then you can't dismiss Mormonism because they're making the same claim. And you can't dismiss the Roman Catholic Church and you can't dismiss any religion because they're all claiming special revelation. And they're meeting Mary every day and, and say ba, Baba, whatever, from India, they're meeting every day. Okay, so that's that. I mean, that's that's a, a, not just a, a nuclear weapon. That's a... Uh, a, hy- a, a hydrothermal weapon. There's, there's no way to respond to it, except to say that Matthew had some license of the Holy Spirit. The moment you say that, then no, then you understand that nothing, then no religion, no claim can be invalidated. That means then, then it's a that has that's a, a fallacy because it 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 it, it cannot be disproved. W- would you um, would you take medication? Uh, based on an FDA that did that, that just simply jettisoned uh, failures and only... That means imagine a medicine that you would... You, the drug companies would be thrown in prison forever for doing this. People would go to jail for this, okay? All right, let's move on here because I don't want to go to... Look, then you have the famous um, Matthew chapter 8 where Matthew misquotes Isaiah. Isaiah is the, has already told us that who the servant is in the 53rd chapter because Isaiah has introduced the servant to us in Isaiah 41. Uh, so in Isaiah 41, verse 8 and 9, Isaiah 43, verse 10 and 11, 43, verse 10, explicitly states, Atem Eidainu Meshem Avdi Hashem You are my... What is Atem Eidai? What does Eidai mean? You are my witnesses, it's plural. Uh, Abdi, my servant. It means the servant is many people, not one. Uh, and then you have Isaiah 44, verse 1, 44, verse 21, 45, verse 4, 48, verse 20, 49, verse 3. I don't mean to, but this is a show, so I can't, you know, I'm not going to, you look it up. And this is a thing, you can stop it, pause, and look it up, okay? 49, 3, it says openly that the, the nation of Israel is God's servant. There are more than them because Matthew is going to cite people who, who are the wrong people. So Matthew, for example, the end of 23, which is a which is a terrible chapter. When I say terrible, it's not poorly written, but it's a chapter that portrays the Jews in as 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 responsible. Well, why should I why should I paraphrase? As responsible for all the innocent death from that of Abel, the first victim of murder to Zechariah, the son of Berechiah. That's not really a fulfillment citation, but he got it wrong. It's the wrong Zechariah. Zechariah, the son of Yehoiada, is the last. You have um, you have then another one, a doozy, in Matthew chapter 27, verse 9, where Judas Iscariot, we are told, you know, accepts 30 pieces of silver. This is Matthew's passion narrative, which in my opinion is the most is um, responsible for the death of more Jews than any other uh, chap, any other book in the Bible. The, the, people argue John is worth. I think M- Matthew's done more damage. So Judas Iscariot accepts uh, accepts a bribe to betray Jesus. That's the key point. But this is not an arbitrary event in the book of Matthew. According to Matthew, this is a fulfillment of what is in the book of Jeremiah. The only thing is it doesn't say it in Jeremiah, <laughs> it's in Zechariah, and half the verse is not even there. And then you have the very famous Matthew 27, still in the same passion narrative. This is an f- infamous chapter. This is the chapter where we're introduced, the only time, to Pontius Pilate's wife, who sees Jesus as innocent. Like, all the Gentiles get it, and the Jews just want to kill Jesus for some reason. But here we have the text that they cast lots for the clothing, which is a a misquote of the book of of Psalms, who is King David, just so you know, because these people make this mistake repeatedly. If you look at Psalm 15, 16, 17, 18, what is going on? What's the context? If you're a Christian, don't be angry at me, but very few Christians I've met really know. Unless there's a PhD after your name, it's unlikely. Are there some studious Christians out there? There are, but they're not. They don't really study this. King David is a tzaddik. He's a very holy, righteous man, but he's not perfect. 
Because a person who's perfect, born of a virgin, what am I going to learn from him? King David made mistakes, and he had tremendous, he suffered tremendous betrayal in his life. And his enemies all wanted to destroy him. They, they, he, his, his father-in-law wanted to kill him, his predecessor, his wife mocked him, his friend turned against him. Has anyone ever betrayed you in your life and stuck a knife in your back and then turned it? You know what I'm talking about. So in these chapters, King David speaks about his own betrayal, and betrayal is very bad. You know, it's one thing if you go to uh, a, uh, some playground with your kids and someone pickpockets you. All right, the guy's a thief. It's certainly very upsetting, but it's different. If you imagine you find out that the person who pickpocketed you was your own brother. Imagine you find the wallet that was taken out of your thing and it turns out your brother has it in his attic. Imagine how much worse that is. That's betrayal. A regular thief who takes your money, oh, he took my money, he got, it certainly has to be more careful, so uh, it's a very upsetting, certainly. Uh, but what are people upset about? Now I have to go order new credit cards and so on. But if you found out it was your brother, oh, that's very bad. This is what, you found out your best friend in the world was sleeping with your wife, that makes it a thousand times. This is what King David went through. And for many people, when they're betrayed, they pretty much give up. And they go, I'm out. I'm signing off. I don't mean to become suicidal necessarily, but they basically detach themselves from this world. And they certainly detach themselves from God and walk away from faith. And those who managed not to, even though people tore their clothes away, and they were, imagine, someone steals your clothes, they cuts it up, and they cast lots for clothing, meaning, I'm getting his shirt, he has a nice shirt, he has a nice thing, and they, they were taking this property from him and, and dividing it. And King David is speaking in these chapters, this is the point, this is Psalm 22, and t- King David is saying, they did this to me. King David, if you read the beginning of Psalm 22, if you fear God, do this. If you don't, Psalm 22 begins. King David is saying, you know, God, I, I, I feel sometimes you don't listen to me. I, you know, and, and you did listen to my ancestors. Now, who's talking? That can't be God of the second person speaking to God, the son, speaking to God, the father, the first person. Read it in context. So King David is talking, discussing, describing events that have occurred to him in the past, in the first person. Now, early Christians are naturally hungry for any text in the Jewish Bible that can be construed, misconstrued, to, to be talking about a suffering Messiah and applied, especially Psalm 22, the crucifixion psalm chapter, and took that and used it as a fulfillment citation with, with Matthew did and got away with it. Matthew, they got away with it. It's sitting there, and I am sure there are Christians right now, as I'm speaking, who are sitting there and opening up these books and going, I know this Rabbi Singer is not a Christian, and he's not a supporter of Christianity, but he's making some very he's fantastic claims. If they're true, these are very serious charges. I need to find out. I hope you'll do that. I hope you look it up on your own. I hope you'll call your pastor and say, give me an answer. Don't talk Septuagints. Don't tell me there's a, there's a Bible done by Eskimos. Just tell me, answer. Give it to me straight. So though these are the classic fulfillment citations. There are actually more. There are, I think, in the Christian Bible, I may be off on this number, but I'm not off by much. I think there are around 214 not fulfilled. So these are texts where Matthew's literally saying, this was to be fulfilled what was said by Jeremiah. Oops, Zechariah. All right. So those are like fulfillment. He's actually using that word. But actually, there are many times where just texts are cited. Luke will do it too, without saying it in this manner. There are over 200 of them. And every one of them is egregious. Every one of them is ripped out of context completely. So that's a, that would be a, that would be very easy to do. And every Christian has to take this very seriously. Because if, if, if Matthew corrupted the text, that speaks to the credibility of the first gospel. And if, 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 if the New Testament, it's not just then becomes a, a benign book 
that is not the word of God, it means it's a, a theological crime scene. And one has to not walk, not run, but fly out away from it as fast as you can. That, that's without question. And it is my prayer that, that people who are Christians or are in the church or considering it would prayerfully look at these texts, not that they would leave Christianity and the Christian the enemy. That's not the point. And do talk about this birth of the Almighty. I'll say one last thing. I have wondered how did not Christians fix up these problems? Because Christians did fix up other problems. They changed texts to, co- co- to comport with orthodoxies that would develop later. But they never cleaned these up. These are just laying all of fingerprints everywhere, up and down. No bleach, nothing. No one tried to, no one tried to wipe it down, wipe down the hard drive. No one reformatted the drive. Someone could have, and they didn't. And I think it is so, I can't prove it. Just, I think God put this there. and well, Not that God told Matthew what to do, but I think maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe, like, why didn't someone later go, you know what, maybe we should, this, this is a mess. And incidentally, Matthew is cleaning up Mark. He makes Mark read much better, fixes up texts. But this is not cleaned up. And I think God is making it easy, for relatively easy, to leave the church. Because the, this evidence, if what I've just said is true, which it is, it's unassailable. And therefore, then the Christian Bible is a, is a crime scene. It must be, it's not nice literature. There's nothing good about it. There's nothing redeemable about it. There are some truths in it, but those things that are true in the Christian Bible are not new. But these new things in the Christian Bible are definitely not true. Thank you for calling in. Adon olam, יציר נברא ואת נעשה בחפצו כל אזי מלך 